say how exciting it is to have an author with us on his publishing day. That doesn't happen a lot, so we're very happy to welcome Matt with us. My name is Ginger Olszewski, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this evening's launch event for Matt Goldman's new mystery novel, Carolina Moonset, which is set right here in our beloved Buford. Tonight's special event here at the Buford Bookstore is presented in partnership with our nonprofit Pat Conroy Literary Center. Matt Goldman is a New York Times best-selling author of the Mill Shapiro Mystery Series. He is also a playwright and an Emmy Award-winning television writer whose lists of credits include Seinfeld and Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> Matt lives in Minnesota. <laughs> Matt lives in Minnesota with his wife, two dogs, two cats, and whichever children happen to be around. <laughs> In a star review, Publishers Weekly praised Matt's new novel, Carolina Moonset, with this. At the start of this first class mystery, Joey Green, the owner of a Chicago jewelry company, returns to Beaufort, South Carolina to visit his father, Marshall, who's suffering from a disease that's rapidly destroying his short-term memory. Joey offers to stay with Marshall for a few days while his mother, Carol, takes a much needed break. Carol's three-day vacation in Florida turns into a feverish nightmare for Joey when Thomas Hammond, patriarch of Beaufort's most important family, is shot dead one night near the Green's house. As Joey tries to discover who killed Thomas, he comes to realize that Marshall's teenage memories hold the key to murders that occurred decades earlier. The often amusing dialogue flows naturally, the emotional undercurrents ring true, and the mystery itself offers a full complement of suspects and motives. This novel about love, loss, and family ties isn't to be missed. Matt will be interviewed this evening by Jonathan Houck, the executive director of the Pat Conway Literary Center, the former director of the University of South Carolina Press, and co-editor of Our Prince of Scribes, Writers Remember Pat Conroy, the winner of 17 book awards. Jonathan has also reviewed Carolina Moonset for the Pulitzer Prize winning Charleston Post and Courier. Please join me in welcoming Matt Goldman and Jonathan Hunt. Thank you, Ginger. We appreciate that. Thank you, everybody, for being with us this evening. Thank you, Matt, especially Thank for being here on Publication Day. Thanks for having me. I, I always hoped I would be able to be down here for Publication Day. It's yeah. a dream realized. It is a dream realized. <laughs> Buford is a dream realized. Yes, it in is. Ways. <laughs> So as Ginger mentioned in your introduction, you're having a really good run with the Neil Shapiro books. Yes. You've won some awards, a New York Times bestseller for those books. Everything seems to be going really well with that character in that setting. Yeah. So why deviate from that and come here to Buford and give us an unlikely detective story with Joey Green and his family? My publisher told me to. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 I think it goes in cycles, but with series right now, unless you're Lee Child or Sue Grafton, yes. they often don't go past four books, so uh, or five. And that that character may come back, but but when they asked me to do a standalone, I was excited to do it. So uh, just to, uh, I think there's some people who just aren't as interested in PI fiction, just as a genre, so to, to make it more of a family mystery mm -hmm. uh, really uh, opened up a lot of possibilities for me. It's this really thoughtful balancing act between multi-generational mystery, this family dynamic story, and also this sort of uh, middle age romance story, this love story as yeah. well. So all three are happening simultaneously, but they all intersect in wonderful ways. Oh, thank you. Did you know that was going to be the case? Did you have these sort of three plot lines in mind, or did it happen organically? As it, it, to it, it, it happened organically for me. I'm mm -hmm. not a big plotter ahead of time. Uh, because I worked in TV and we worked on 20, 15 episodes a season, um, used to be more than that. I, I just have a lot of experience working on stories, so eventually I learned after hitting my head against the wall so long. So I'm able to kind of figure it out as I go, and, and I do that so the characters are up on their feet and interacting, and they can develop, that story can develop from the inside out. So is it the characters that come to you first and everything else kind of builds around them, or 
what? what yes, it is the characters. Be? All I knew when I started this book was that this middle-aged guy would go visit his retired parents, and uh, my father suffered from Lewy body dementia, and he lost his short-term memory, but his long-term memory was excellent, and my dad was a talker, uh, very extroverted, and he couldn't talk about the weather or his politics or sports, so he started telling stories from his childhood to my childhood that I hadn't heard before, and that kind of sparked the idea for what if a, a story came up from way back when and, and mixed up with the present day next to me. And it just kind of evolved. The romance part of it was really, uh, I don't mean to embarrass my mother, uh, who's sitting right here, but when I was in my 40s, I was single, and they, my, my parents would always be mentioning some other person that happened to know who was single. So it felt like a natural <laughs> fit, because I wanted Joey to have a, you know, he's not a private detective or a policeman, mm -hmm. um, but I wanted him to have a partner in, in, in his informal investigation, and so I made this woman who's a smart psychologist, and they had a spark. They're mm -hmm. both on vacation to the UK. And she just happens to be next door. She just happens to be next door. <laughs> Easier access. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's confident. And, yes. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To say sidekick would be dismissive because she really brings so much on her yeah, own. Right? Yeah, she's she smarter than he is. is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Significantly so in some yeah. moments. Yeah. So let's circle back to the idea of, of Buford as setting, too. Uh, and I asked you uh, when you came in if you know, you know why that is. Joey has this loose family connection to Buford. It's a place he's familiar with, but he's not yes. necessarily of in the way that Pat, right. Pat Conroy's characters Correct. are of the low country. Yes. He's got some distance from it, and yes. that sort of shapes his perspective. But what about you? What, what's your connection to this place, um, as Buford? My great-grandfather settled here uh, when he immigrated, and, uh, and I've been coming here my entire life. So I have early memories of here. I've been shrimping and crabbing and had uh, oyster steams. Is that the right word? Steams? Oyster rubs. 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 O
that it, uh, has made a lot of money in property development mm -hmm. and is continuing to do it. And um, and so that, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly. Well, this, yeah, but, yeah. The idea of striking a balance between development, yes. preser conservation, uh, preservation. Yes, and there, uh, and, and everybody I talk to in this town, especially people who have been here for a long time, mentioned that traffic is getting worse. Uh, it's not the town it used to be, but it is. And, you know, when you look out on the marsh, it's still beautiful. And there is that balance between economic development, and there is a character, uh, Joey's great uncle, who talks about that. We, you know, we don't want to have a ghost town. We want to have a thriving town, but there's a balance that has to be struck there. Mm -hmm. You know, part of what so impressed me about the way you handle that in the novel is that you know, we don't stop the plot to have these conversations. They're organic to the characters who have these belief structures. Bubba, for example, has a lot to say about the waterways, but yes. we don't stop the plot to, to have that conversation. Yes. It's central to who he is. It is central to who he is. Bubba is a fishing guide that the family goes out with uh, and has for years. And he does talk about the change to the water and the fishing and the migratory patterns of the fish. But it's not just to spout off about climate change. It also, I think, will create, it allows, I don't want to give away too much, but he, that gives him motivation to be a viable suspect for what's going on. Yeah, we can, yes. We can take similar approaches with racism, with gender and sexual identities. All of this comes up in the course of a conversation because these are all realities of our, of our day to day lives mm -hmm. in this town or any town. But yes. the novel is never preachy about that. It's just time and time again it's authentic to the characters. Okay. And as you say about Thanks. Bubba, it really inform it makes him a viable suspect. Yes. These these aspects of these characters make them subjects of suspicion and concern mm -hmm. for Joey you know, as he stumbles through these investigations. Yeah. I, I do believe in creating uh, you know when there is a mystery there should there should be a lot of viable uh, people uh, who does, <laughs> um, and and because I'm a believer in fair storytelling, so the people in the advanced reading copies that I've heard from have all said, "Oh, I was so surprised." And but if somebody does guess it, that's fine with me. It's the it's when you go invest your time to read a book, and then there's this like crazy thing at the end. We go, "What? How did that's where did that come from?" And I just don't think that's fair. So, uh, so I do like to give everybody a, a, to kind of just hold them into the plot in that way. Do you know the answer? Do you know who done it when you start out, or is that something that you discover in the course of writing it? Uh, it's something I discover in the course of writing it, and and often when I start out, I don't even know what got done. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, but. But again, and, and, and because I've had the, the good luck to work on all those episodes of TV, I kind of learn story, as opposed to you know how many novels can a person write in, in, in a lifetime. Um, so I just churn through enough stories to really kind of mm -hmm. get a feel for where not to go or to get a feeling for where when I'm off track. You handle the balance really well, and uh, you know, the sort of classic example of this is Chekhov's gun. Are y'all some of you familiar with that? If you introduce a firearm early in a, in a novel, somebody better have shot it, you know, by the third act, <laughs> or you're just wasting the reader's time by putting yes. it in there. And you have what I've come to think of as Chekhov's tackle box, which is really yes. the absence of a gun, yes. not so much a gun, but a gun is gone yes. missing, and there's yeah. payoff for that. So it's yeah. not you know, random details thrown in. Every time something is introduced, there's a payoff to yeah. it later. Do you, are, is that happening organically while you're writing it, or are you, you know, halfway through and you think, I'm, when I do the next round of revision, I've got to insert something so I can get to the a, point. A little bit of both. I, I, I have three documents open when I'm writing. I don't. Um, I have the manuscript. I have a journal I keep alongside of it, and I have a to-do list. <laughs> so when I get to a certain point, I think, oh, this would be great. If, if this happened, but in order to make that work well, I need to go back. So I don't go back and do it right then. I just keep a list and, and, and go back and fix it uh, in the next pass. How many rounds of revision do you say you do in the course of following that model? I would say I do 
two to three revisions before my wife sees it. <laughs> She's a really good reader. Yes, reader. For content and for typos, which I am terrible at. Uh, and then, so I get her thoughts and I do another round of, and then I send it to my agent and she has a few thoughts. And by the time my editor sees it, what she thinks is a first draft, it's really about a fifth or a sixth. <laughs> and then I'll do one or two more for her and then it goes into, and then when I get the final thing is the copy edits and then I'll still be making changes. Yeah. So it's probably six or seven or eight. Yeah. Quite the load, but no, yeah. it makes sense. It makes yeah. sense given what you're trying to achieve. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Yeah. One of the other great strengths of this story for me was the dialogue. I think you handle it so beautifully. Characters Thanks. always sound uniquely like themselves. And it's not it's it's consist it's a consistent voice for character, but you do such interesting things with it. And I'll give you a really small example and I'm not not ruining a plot point because it happens early on. But there's a scene at the airport where mm -hmm. um, they're waiting for Joey's luggage to come up and Marshall is standing there. And yeah. Joey is finally starting to realize how severe his father's dementia is. So Marshall makes a, a quick little joke. It's not mm -hmm. terribly funny, but it's right. funny enough. But then he says it again because he doesn't remember that he says it. And it happens three or four times. So it goes from being funny to being heartrending in yeah. just a couple of paragraphs. It's so well handled. Yes. How do you, you do that? How do you write dialogue like that? That, get inside these people's heads and, and make them real to what they say. Um, that's my mom's phone. Right <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I knew I shouldn't have brought it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, well, as long as your mom. It's, it's, it's okay. No, no. Yeah, oh, it's, it's okay. absolutely okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, I wrote my dad's voice. When, mm -hmm. when, and so it's not his story, but it's... Uh, but it, it's his voice, and when I, it's just writing experience, I think, hearing people talk, and then I can kind of learn. You know, when I was a very young writer, and I wanted to write television, I used to go sit in coffee shops, and next to people who were talking, and I would type what they said, mm -hmm. just so I could see it on the page, how the punctuation would go, and, mm -hmm. and, and try to get the feel for how people really talk. So when I have a character's, voice in my head, then I can keep it consistent, yeah. They have to be fully realized. Yeah, and that's yeah. another reason I don't outline. I want to yeah. get to know them on their mm -hmm. feet for, uh, I, as opposed to, I don't want to create a story, and, and I just, this is, I know this from television, because we have to outline in TV. There's all, all these production people that have, you know, networks and the studios that have to be on the same page, but you, when you come up with a story outline, at least when I do, I use the same part of my brain as I do to make a shopping list. Like it's not the most, uh, it's it's not part of my subconscious. And then I, I tried not to do it, but I saw other people do it. They would make that story and then they would try to hammer their characters into place mm -hmm. to make it fit the story. Mm -hmm. And that's when characters start acting inconsistently you know, when you read a book and you say, wait, why would that person do that? They, you know, 20 pages ago, they did something different. Mm -hmm. um, whenever you're watching a TV show and, and a character says, well, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but, and <laughs> it's because that happened. Um, <laughs> and, it ha and you see it all the time. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> the, uh, the North Carolina Lee Smith describes that, that magic moment when the characters become real. Yes. She says she just becomes a transcriptionist at that point. They're, it, and they're it, living in her head. And she's just writing down and the conversations. It, it does happens. happen. And you think you want the story to go somewhere, and you yeah. erase it. So you have to find another way to tell it. Did that happen for you in this particular book? Were there moments where the characters pivoted on you? It I'm does sorry. happen. Um, and and I've, I've learned to get used to those days when that happens, because I used to get very frustrated because I have every day, seven days a week, I, I stick to. And then when I hit those spots where I get lost, I, I have to stop and go for a walk and push the word count aside for that one or two or three days. And in a way, I have to wait for the answer to come. I can't, I can't solve it like a math problem. Mm -hmm. um, and 
go down wrong roads, but then it comes and then everything's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you find the relationship story between Joey and Leela? Leela, right? yes. Leela, very easy to write because it comes off on the page almost effortless. So I'm, I'm wondering if that's a good screenwriter at work, good characters at work, or uh, that's just the illusion of somebody who's revised 16 times before that's, <laughs> maybe that's what happened. It's a little bit of all of that, but also uh, four and a half years ago, I met somebody who I married four years ago. So mm -hmm. so we it was a combination of life experience and chemistry uh, that, that I'd had that experience with two people who know what they want, they've, they've been married, they've been single for a long time and dated. So when they meet the right person uh, in middle age, they mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. it clicks. Mm -hmm. And so I really wanted to make sure that that was grounded so it just didn't come off as a convenient for the story. Mm -hmm. But it was based on some life experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is that like for you to have a character who is so much like you? Exposed, naked on the page, as Conroy used to say. Um, well, it, it's okay. I think that's just part of writing. It's, um, um, you know, he's not a horrible person. He's uh, <laughs> eminently uh, likable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so so it, it was, uh, I felt comfortable with doing that. You know, I just, I changed him enough to, to your questions in just a few minutes, so uh, consider this your ten, eight to ten minute warning on <laughs> that front. But <clears throat> well, I'm curious about where your, your story as a writer begins. How does one become a TV writer? How did you become a TV writer? Well, I, I, I liked to read when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I, met, I think I always, part of me wanted to be a writer. No one ever told me I couldn't be one. I just didn't know it. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I, I thought that was something you don't do. You just get a regular job. And I went to college, and I was in pre-med, and I was a chemistry major. And some friends asked me to go see stand-up comedy live, which I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. This is 1983. And I went to see stand-up comedy, and for some reason I thought I should be doing that. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, so I had to make that call to my parents. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and I I am not a natural performer. I'm quite introverted, and, which you'd be probably surprised to know almost all stand-ups are. Um, and, but it went very well for me. I, I didn't love performing, but I loved the writing part. Mm -hmm. And I was in Minneapolis at a time when stand-up was big, but there wasn't a lot of cable TV yet. And all the national acts who came through, they would have me open for them because my act was clean, which I didn't do because I'm a prude. I just wanted to be on the Tonight Show, so I wanted to be on the Tonight Show. And I didn't cover familiar premises. So I, I would be the opening act for a lot of national acts who came through, and they, I would get off the stage and they'd always say, good writing which is a not very nice way of saying you're not a very good performer. <laughs> um, but I got a lot of encouragement to move out there and write, and, and I did. I was, I was 20, I just turned 24. I was, I was a boy. I got up in my, in my dented Ford Escort with not enough money, and I just drove out there, and it worked out. So, um, uh, and then I, I liked writing TV for a while, but I always wanted to write books. And, and, there was a point where, and what attracted me to comedy was it's, it's very human, mm -hmm. um, and, and the characters are flawed, and, and, and you know, the, the great uh, comedic characters are just, you know, like Jackie Gleason, and Lucille Ball, and George Costanza, and Frazier <laughs> Crane, like, they're, they're idiots, and, but we love them because they're us, and when TV, got very popular with shows like The Wire and The Sopranos and Breaking Bad and Good Wife. TV just it changed Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Like all the good work was being done in TV and TV was the it thing. It used to be movies. You want to work in movies. Mm -hmm. If you can't, then you work in TV. 
But those dramas, and they were all dramas, changed mm -hmm. that. And so the executives in charge of comedy said, we want comedy to be cool. And, and to me, it just became less human when it started to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write drama. And to, to do my homework, I started reading crime fiction, which I had never really read mm -hmm. before. I was a big literary fiction snob. I, I don't know why I was writing sitcoms, but uh, but and when I, I just fell in love with crime fiction because as a writer I discovered that when you have a crime at the center of your story, when there's a dead body and the clues keep coming along, it kind of frees up your characters to just be people. They don't have to carry the whole weight of the story, and that's mm -hmm. what I was attracted to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I read crime fiction or like John Le Carre spy books this the spy or the crime part is the least interesting part to me I just I'm just fascinated by the characters mm -hmm. yeah you've got a sort of built-in driver of the plot there's a problem to be solved there's there risks and who, who the characters become in the course of addressing that issue reveals who they are yeah it puts them under pressure like any story does but they can they can have a problem in their personal life and then the phone rings and it's, we got the prince off the gun, or whatever it is, <laughs> and the story moves forward. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what crime novels were you drawn to when you started doing your research and started diving into that world? And, and what are you reading now for that matter? Uh, uh, the jo um, Raymond Chandler mm -hmm. was a big influence on me because it was, narr you know, I had all this experience writing comedy and, and, and developing my own and Raymond Chandler's novels are narrated by a, by a detective named Philip Marlowe. So he can be very funny in his narration. Sometimes he's a smart aleck in conversation, sometimes he's not. But he can make these great social commentaries and, uh, and, and you, you just really root for this person because you're in his head and, and, and he's, he's vulnerable in his narration. And so I thought, oh, that's how I can write a crime novel. I can make not his voice, but my voice, mm -hmm. and, and do that. Um, and right now, I, I mentioned John Le Carre, who I didn't read until maybe a year ago for the first mm -hmm. time. And I'm obsessed with <laughs> those books. And just the voice of, of the storytelling. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't care about if the spy is going to get killed. I care that he goes home and his wife says how was work and he can't tell her mm -hmm. and what the conflict that comes from that I, I, mm -hmm. and just and just the depth of character uh, is, is amazing to me yeah you have them it's, it, it's reflected in, in what you write particularly in the relationships with the mm -hmm. family that, you know there, there are murders to be solved things are happening yeah. that are affecting this town yeah. But Carol just wants to go to a pickleball tournament. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, and for those who play, you can completely understand that. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, you balance that so well. Oh, sort thank of you. deep stakes, is literally life and death yeah. stakes. But also, there's this family who know each other and love each other. And there's this new relationship that's happening adjacent to that. And all three yeah. things have, are given equal weight in, in a voice that would come to like and trust. Joey just comes off the page as, as a relatable character, oh, somebody that I'll you. happily spend 280 pages with. Thank you. As, a, as an absolute joy. So oh, congratulations. That's thank you so much. All it's of very those nice. So yeah. well. Thank you. Are you worried a little bit about how this town and these people are going to read a book about Beaufort, South Carolina, <laughs> and what, what they'll what they'll bring to that or take from that? Well, I'm not worried about it, but having written books about Minneapolis where I grew up and mm -hmm. books that take place there yeah. I'll get something wrong someone's gonna send me a letter and I apologize <laughs> right now for getting it wrong I tried not to but but I I don't know I mean I, I tend to write about places I love mm -hmm. because I have to spend all this time there in my head <laughs> and so I you know when I because I lived in Los Angeles for a very long time and I would always get the question why do you keep picking me over Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I don't like Los Angeles. I don't want to spend <laughs> eight hours a day with that in my head. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I like it more than I used to now that I don't live there. 
Um, <laughs> but 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 I really you know love Minnesota and I, and I love it here and and so uh, but I'm always happy to hear. I'm sure I'll get something wrong. But I've had people show up with maps and say, I followed this character, and they, you don't turn here, you turn there. I, I don't think you do, because look, that's a one way, and that's, oh, I'm sorry. So, but I try to, to get it right. Yeah, I was down here twice last year, uh, just for the Friday class. That was my next question, yeah. actually, about what, what kind of research you did here, do you think, specific to this time? Well, I do research in person to go see the places, and you know, I never, I do use real businesses in my work uh, and streets, but I never use anyone's real house. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to get a feeling for a couple of the houses. Um, although there's a house mentioned on Craven Street, I won't say where, mm -hmm. but that house was in my family for three generations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I knew I had that house in my mind. Yeah. And there's a reference to title home and house from the big chill. Well. Uh huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I say it's not like that neighborhood in the Big Chill. It is that neighborhood. <laughs> yes, the yes, exactly. yeah. good line. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious as to whether or not the comedy writing, the TV writing, all of that kind of blends together when you're sitting down, or are these entirely separate universes? I once asked uh, uh, the writer Jill McCorkle about that. Mm -hmm. She writes short stories and novels. Right. And I asked her if doing one helped her do the other. And she said that writing a novel has as much in common with writing a short story as writing a short story has with baking a cake. Mm -hmm. Completely yeah, separate worlds, right. creative acts, yeah. but otherwise completely separate. Yeah. Is, it a, is it a different part of your brain that you tap into? Um, part of it is and part of it isn't. Uh, characters are the same. Mm -hmm. You have much more uh, time in a novel and, 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 and flexibility because you can get inside people's heads, which you can't really do unless you have voiceover. Uh, characters, relationships uh, are the same, but how, how things flow and, and play out are completely different. And, uh, and the first few books I wrote, I was still working in television. Now I'm not working in television at all. So, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, so I can just keep my head in one space. Let's see if our illustrious audience here has some questions they can uh, they can add to the equation. Keep in mind, those of you who have read the novel, we don't want to spoil anything. I have a question. Yes. Uh, I'm a new writer. I just wrote a book and hoping to get it published in a couple of weeks. Yeah. And I went through a long publishing thing, about 18 months, I guess, with a publisher. And uh -huh. I'm just wondering what your experience has been uh, and your involvement with your publisher. I know there's an awful lot to put a book together, what it's going to look like, the yeah. front cover, the back cover, the page design, the size of the type, the, the fonts you use, yeah. uh, pictures, no pictures. What was your involvement in this and your other books with a publisher? Well, you, you often hear horror stories, but I have mostly had a good experience. One, I really love my editor. Another woman who's smarter than I am, like uh, even smarter than Joey in the yes. book. And so I, I really trust her. And they've been great with covers for me. Um, uh, but th it is a long lead time. With a, I'm with Macmillan uh, Forge as an imprint of Macmillan. There's a long lead time in getting a book published. I have written one and a half books since uh, since this was out of my hands. And so uh, I don't have any say about font. They don't ask me about that. Um, they do ask me about cover. Titles are always an issue. I stuck to my guns on this title. I mm -hmm. thought it was the right title for this book. Mm -hmm. um, they've always wanted me to have more thrillery title titles, <laughs> but I don't really write those kind of thrillery books they're more about the the people involved in the relationships and uh, uh, and so people who if I write a, have a thrillery title the people who read them are disappointed <laughs> and if I and if I and then the people who would like them never pick it up because they're not going to read that kind of book. Right. so so I think we're getting on the right path with that but 
you know, with, at the end of the day, if you're with a traditional publisher, it's their decision what the cut is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I wish, I thought they crammed, up, not really, It's but I, I wanted even more, more white space on the pages here. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not bad by, as far as what you can see out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is a contemplative book and it has a contemplative title and it's reflected in the, in the design, both external and internal to the pages. So oh. I thought they did a nice job. Yeah, I think they did too. Yeah. And, uh, and again, my editor, who is my primary contact person that I, who I have creative conversations with, I really like her. And, I, and I, in talking to her authors, I know that doesn't happen all the time. It's, it's not universally right. true. Right. No, it's Correct. definitely not. Other questions, audience? Oh, right up front. Yeah. Yes. Do you know if it's going to be a recorded book? It is a recorded book. Audio? Awesome, it yes. That's very cool. Yes, wherever you get your recorded books, it is, it is out. That's wonderful. Yeah. Does Beef at Library have some? I don't know. I, I, I actually... They should be told. They should, should be told. told. Are, are <laughs> gifted. In, in, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, time they open tomorrow. Maybe I'll see, I'll be in Savannah later tomorrow. But yeah. we'll go as a group. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but in general, the libraries have been very supportive of Good. our books. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. And I'm always, I have people say, I hope you don't mind. I got your book at the library. And I, I don't care. Like, I think it's great. I'm like, I think it's great when my people get books at the library. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. um, but don't anybody here do it. Because we're in a book <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> also, the unique thing about this book is it came out in the hardcover and paperback at the same time. Mm -hmm. oh, nice. Which, which uh, at first I thought, and, and they asked me if I minded, and then I thought, I, I don't mind at all. Some people want a hardcover, some people, mm -hmm. especially mystery readers, would rather buy the paperback. Mm -hmm. And either one's. Is that a new thing in publishing? Do you think that's interesting? I, it seems dumb. I mean, I'm not used to that. I don't know. I'll tell you how it happened, and I can say this because it's not a Barnes and Noble in our division. No. 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 Oh, that's, that takes away. forever to get an hour and away. Right. Uh, just yeah. to get to that guard date. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, uh, they asked for it. So, and, and they're big enough that my publisher said, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it, but it's great because I now people can get it uh, in whichever mm -hmm. format they like. Yeah, and, yeah. and both formats are available here at Buford yeah. Bookstore this evening mm -hmm. in Savannah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But I've seen that happen more and more often, and not yeah. just with mysteries. And for those very reasons, for yeah, the needs of multiple audiences, what a library needs versus what a yeah. bookstore needs, but they both need it at the same yeah, time. Yeah, because the library will want hard covers. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have any say in the narrator for the audio edition? Have you ever had say? In yes, but, um, because I have, uh, you know, in television, the writers are the producers. When you see all those producer names, mm -hmm. most of them are writers, and uh, and and we have final say in everything. So I have a ton of experience casting actors. Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. So I kind I insisted on that, um, and. And uh, I, I think the person who did such a really good job, yeah. Excellent. I rejected several, for sure. <laughs> As a good casting director. Sure. Yeah, yes. yes. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Um, I haven't read it. I love the cover. I think it's beautiful. And I see that um, William Kent Kruger blurred for you. So yes. he was an emissary. Are you all personal friends? I am personal <laughs> friends with Kent. I got to know him uh, after my first books came out. I met him at a book event. Telling Jonathan, and he really is a, one of the true gentlemen out there. Uh, I think he's a great writer, and he's just a lovely person. So, and when I asked him if he blur, you know, every writer hates asking someone to blur their book, uh, but he said absolutely, and then he just gave me the most. That's a part of the blurb, mm -hmm. the whole thing. It's just a very kind and generous. I blurb. haven't read his mystery series, but his newer books. And he spoke in Savannah, and he's got a great sense of humor. He does, and he's a he wonderful public speaker. Isn't he? Yes, he was. Yes. So for anybody who hasn't read William Kent Kruger, uh, This Tender Land, mm -hmm. uh, Ordinary Grace. Ordinary Grace. Yes. And then he has a, uh, a crime series, the Cork O'Connor series, that's set mm -hmm. way up in northern mm -hmm. Minnesota. Mm -hmm. so. Quite nice stuff. Yes, it's the most recent one. Almost, almost mm -hmm. YA, because it's done in Cork. 
Yes, yeah. it is a prequel. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that was wonderful that he did that. Yeah, um, very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned when we were discussing the pre-show, I interviewed Garrett for the Bluffton Book Festival mm -hmm. uh, for Lightning Strike specifically, and I asked him, you know, here we are in the South at this Bluffton right. Book Festival where we talk about Southern literature and, yeah. and the defining characteristics of that, and I asked him, if are there in fact any defining characteristics of Midwestern literature, and if so, what? And I will share his answer, yes, but I'm, I'm curious about your yeah, answer. Yeah, I want to hear his first. Do I have to answer <laughs> Up to you, up to you. Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, uh, the writer who made me want to be a writer is a Midwestern writer, Kurt Vonnegut. Mm -hmm. And, I, and what attracted to me was, one, the sense of humor, two, he, he kind of thought like a 15-year-old boy, which I think I was when I discovered <laughs> him, and, uh, and just clean, really clean prose, yes. which mm -hmm. he could express complex ideas, but in a very clean, simple, mm -hmm. plain talk sort of way. Plain spoken. Is plain spoken. spoken. So, oh, yeah, yes. that's mm -hmm. it. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. But the ideas were complex. There was a ton yeah. of things going on across, uh, below the surface. Yes. The surface was easy, easier to navigate because of the language that was used. Yeah, and Twain did that as well. Yes, sure. And I think mm -hmm. one of the reasons he did it is because he sat tight. Mm. And so, you, when you physically set tight, yeah. uh, you, 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 have, you learn an economy of language. Mm -hmm. And now that we all text, we're all doing it. So mm -hmm. it's uh, mm -hmm. that, it's true. nothing more mm -hmm. frustrating than mm -hmm. that. Yes. And now that thought. we have all the emojis, we're getting back to hieroglyphics. <laughs> 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 yeah, there's yeah, going to be an animal, animal on the side of the cave, yes. and yes. that means I want to go eat dinner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? What, oh, what yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Right here, and then we'll come right over. Yes. Okay. yes. I'm just curious, in, in the way of classic literature, was there anyone that inspired you from, you know, 18th, 19th century? The Russian writers very much inspired me. Mm -hmm. um, and Crime and Punishment is one of my favorite books of all mm -hmm. time, and I've reread it a few times. Wow. Um, but. But yes, and Twain and Dickens, those, uh, Madame Bovary, the Flaubert book, uh, was a big book for me. Um, mm -hmm. But there, I, I, and I, whenever I'm asked these kind of questions, when I walk in, I should have said this, I should have said that. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, those books were very, uh, especially the Russian Tolstoy, uh, Anna Karenina. Mm -hmm. Brothers Karamazov, those books had a big impact on me. You probably won't see it in this book, but they, but, but they did, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And then we'll, I think we had a question for yeah. you, then we'll come right back over. Just was wondering what we could look forward to your next books. What Are you back to your crime no. series, or are you doing more freestanding? There's another standalone, standalone next summer. Yes. Okay. And what is, can you hint at the setting of that? It's set in Minnesota, very okay. close to where I live now. Uh, actually, where in the suburb I set my first book, mm -hmm. Edina, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's uh, the first book I've written in third person, but it's about a, a woman who's married to a guy and some weird stuff starts happening. And, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, 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 and yeah, just more and more things are revealed. I haven't really written a book like that mm -hmm. yet, mm -hmm. um, so it's my first one. Yeah. Well, so that, be out, be uh, sometime next summer. Okay. Uh, my publication date vary from May to August, so I don't always mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Is that the direction for you from this point onward, standalones, or are we going to get Joey and Leela solving trinket-related crimes it's, in Chicago? <laughs> as far as I know, the, uh, Carolina Moon sets a standalone. I did, it's, so is the book for next year is standalone, and the book I'm working on now is also a standalone. And then I may go back and write a next book. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering if you were going to yes. return to that character. I would the like opportunity to. Opportunity presented itself. Yeah, I have an idea on how to do that as a book that will completely work as a standalone, mm -hmm. and, and then if people are interested, they can go back and read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nancy Springer, who created the Enola Holmes character, stepped uh -huh. away from that character for 12 years. 
was wow. having wrote six books which really completed the arc she was mm -hmm. done she was on to the next thing and then Netflix made a movie and it was yes, the most popular did. movie of that year yeah. and now we're getting Enola Holmes oh, you know, okay. once a year <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because uh, yeah. you never know when the cycle you never do will start up again. Yeah. 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 I think we have one more question yes. over there. Uh, I actually have two questions. Sure. Yes. The first one is, you spoke about your word count, and I was curious about your um, process. What is your word count goal, and how many hours of that a day is it? And my second question, you spoke a lot about John Le Carre and, and some classical um, writers. Is it difficult, basic? Well, is it? The, I'm worried about the modern technology and incorporating that into your stories. Is that an issue? Mm. Ah, okay. And police procedurals and yes. Um, so my word count, like the first week I'm writing, is 500 words a day, uh, and I can do that quite fast usually. But then the rest of the day I'm thinking and I'm actually making notes. In the second week it's about a thousand a day. And then I'm 1,500 a day after that. Uh, and it's seven days a week. And part of the reason it's seven days a week is because I don't outline. So I have to work on it every day or I'll lose the track of what's going on. Um, and modern technology uh, is, a, is a problem for crime fiction. Uh, even more so after that Golden State killer mm -hmm. was yep. arrested a few weeks ago mm -hmm. where they can find DNA and then go take it to 23andMe and find all the cousins of the yeah. murderer. So, <laughs> um, so it is something that has to be considered. Yes. Yeah. I'm curious as to how your mother influenced you in your life. Because I know your mother. Well, my, my mother is an English teacher, so uh, quite a bit. A lot of a lot of books came into the house, uh, and uh, or she was a mathematician, and there was uh, uh, an appreciation for books around the house, and that that was a big influence. Yeah. I have to tell you, from the moment I read the article. I'm thinking, now, is it really Al Buford or is it Beaufort, North Carolina, that we're talking about? And my first question was going to be, do you have any family in this area? Well, that's yes. been answered. <laughs> yeah. No, it's definitely this. But yeah. do you foresee um, this going and making a wonderful movie like Pat Conroy? That's so what I think. I never happen. know. And, and that would be cool. And I get this, because, especially because I've worked in Hollywood, I get the question a lot. My the answer I always say is if I wanted it to be a movie, I would have written it as a movie. Uh, if somebody else wants to make it into a movie, great. Go for it. And whether, and, <laughs> and whether I'm involved or not, I never know. Yeah. They might not want me. Uh, one reason I didn't work in movies much, I did a little bit, is the writer. I mentioned TV, like the writers are in charge, and movies, the director's in charge. It's because of how those two mediums develop. TV came out of theater where the writer is king, mm -hmm. and movies, they didn't have scripts in the beginning. It's just somebody walking around with a camera and saying, you do this and you do that. Mm -hmm. And then it became a director's movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're not very mm -hmm. nice to the writer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Given your background in that world, do you think you were writing the cinematic style, sort of optimistically hoping that something might happen, or even because that's, that's part of your background as a writer? I, I think it's about my background as a writer. I, I know it's hard for people to understand, but because I worked in Hollywood for 30 years, uh, yeah, the money would be great if they make a movie, but I have no, it's, it's not exciting to me. It's much more exciting to be in a book deal than mm -hmm. So um, it's, just, I mean, I worked on some very popular television shows. I never got as excited about that as, as, as the book is, I, to be in the book world to me is, is, is just a great honor. Yeah. Well, to hear that in a town that has three independent bookstores, yeah. it's pretty special. Mm -hmm. Pretty beautiful. Yeah. It is. And quite the literary history. And several several writers in the audience this evening with us mm -hmm. as well. Any final question from anybody before we try and sell some books? Mm -hmm. Which is also a lovely thing to do in a bookstore. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you all so much, and thank you to Matt Goldman for joining us on his publication. <laughs> Excuse me.
Bruce, where would you like Matt to sign books? 